Hello, my lovelies. As you can see, I'm trying to do something a little different today. I'm basically chilling in my bedroom. I've got a green screen behind me so I can add in a new background. The bedroom door is open so the dog may come and go. I might suddenly have a husky in my face. We'll find out. This is not the ideal setup. I'm kind of scrunched in. But I'm just trying to get used to it and see where in my house I can record easily. This does seem to be a good spot. I have scripted today's episode, so I will be reading from a script. Um, please bear with me. Today, we will visit another aspect of my mental health. How much does childhood traumatic brain injuries, TBIs, and concussions impact my mental health today? Honestly, there is no way of knowing for certain because bumping your noggin when I was a child in the 70s and 80s was just considered part of growing up. You put an ice pack on it, watched for balance and behavioral changes, you know, signs of concussion, and we move it on. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Okay, yeah, that's a word I can't say. We're just going to call it CTE. CTE was not a known condition. Computerized tomography, also known as CT or CAT scans, were an emerging technology. They were very expensive, and health insurance only covered a small portion of the cost. Magnetic resonance imaging, also called MRIs, were also in the developmental stages. They were in use by the mid-1980s, but they were only located in major hospitals in major cities. Smaller county hospitals did not have the funding for the expensive machinery. And once again, MRIs were very expensive at the time. A lot of people couldn't afford them even after the insurance paid their fare. So people resisted having these tests run. If you lived in a rural area and needed a CT or MRI, the chances were the doctor had to refer you to another hospital that could be one or two hours away. So most small town doctors still relied on x-rays looking for evidence of fractures to diagnose brain injuries. If there were no fractures, they assumed it was a simple concussion and sent home on concussion protocols. They didn't send you to the big city hospital unless you showed clear signs of cognitive impairment, which was indicative of major brain trauma. We had no idea that little concussions over time had a cumulative effect. We didn't wear helmets when we rode our bicycles, or used our roller skates, or got on a skateboard. So I am left to wonder how many of my personal quirks and eccentricities come from being neurodivergent at birth, and how many developed due to repeated TBIs over time? Am I at risk of developing CTE as I age? Before I delve into that any further, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome all of you to Cape Clowning Country. Thank you so much for stopping by. Now I'm just going to let this information from the Mayo Clinic website scroll while we continue. Rather quickly, Let's look at what concussions, TBE, and CTE are. I am not a medical professional. I am not an expert. I am only giving my layman's understanding of the information I have learned over the years and specifically from the research I've done at websites such as Mayo Clinics. The human brain sits inside your skull, suspended in cerebrospinal fluid. It is very similar to the way an egg yolk is surrounded by the egg white inside of an egg shell. A concussion occurs whenever a force strikes the skull. The energy is transferred to the interior of the skull cavity. The CSF sloshes about, and the brain strikes the interior wall of the skull. That could happen from getting struck by an object, falling and hitting your head on the ground, or standing up and striking your head on something above you. Every time the brain tissue contacts the skull wall, it can cause a bruise on the brain. 
A concussion occurs when the bruising is severe enough to cause a bit of swelling and compression on one area of the brain. Depending on the area of the brain that is affected, you might get a headache, experience visual or other sensory disturbances. You might have trouble with your balance, difficulty communicating, have trouble recalling information, or other signs of neurological disturbance. One step up from a concussion is TBI. These injuries are where a larger part of the brain is involved. There is more severe bruising, swelling, compression of the brain tissues from that swelling, and scar tissue made up of a specific protein forms. The symptoms almost always include loss of consciousness, be that a few seconds to several minutes to hours or even days, a headache, difficulty thinking, blurred vision, or other sensory disruptions, loss of balance, nausea, vomiting, and other neurological disturbances. These are what we tend to see from a single severe trauma, like what might be sustained in a car accident or a fall from a decent height. But they can also occur from multiple smaller traumas over a short period of time. This is what Soldiers experience in combat, or football players experience when blows to the head occur during games and practice over the course of a few weeks. Essentially, one injury, one small concussion, does not have time to heal before the next concussion occurs and the damage accumulates, causing a major TBI. Multiple concussions and TBIs over the course of a lifetime can cause a buildup of scar tissue and a degeneration of the nerve tissues in the brain. This is CTE. There is no cure, and it can only be diagnosed by examining the brain after death. However, a history of head injuries, MRIs, and CT scans showing compromised brain function and clinically observable symptoms can reliably indicate CTE prior to death. Now we're going to go specifically into my life. From about three years old on, my mother knew there was something different, something odd about me. I had issues with fine motor skills. I tended to trip over my own two feet more than other children of my age. I had no discernible sense of humor and I cried out of frustration far too often. These things did not become evident until I entered nursery school at three years old. I also liked to count and sort things. I counted the squares of cement in the sidewalk, pennies, the number of rocks of a certain color in the garden, and other random things. I just liked to count. While other children were running around playing tag, I would be found sitting by myself, counting the petals on a flower. I started reading for my peers. Part of that was due to my mother being a work-from-home typesetter. And this is back in the days when copy and paste was a physical action requiring a light box and a razor blade. Word processing technology did not yet exist. Once I could set up by myself, my mother would set me up with a toy typewriter and have me reproduce a list of simple words. I was helping mom do her work. Daily exposure to written words, while most toddlers were just figuring out how to eat with a spoon, did accelerate my reading skill. But there are also indications that the logic and language centers of my brain developed more quickly than the motor, emotional, and artistic centers did. We do have a baseline of what I was like before the significant head injuries started. I was naturally clumsy, but my mother remembers that I usually caught myself before my head hit the ground. She does remember that I would lean down to pick up objects and lose my sense of space, 
hit my head when I stood back up. It wasn't multiple times in a day or a week. But from the time I started walking, I was banging my head once a month or so. So my baseline is issues with spatial awareness, general clumsiness, a lack of sense of humor, tied to not understanding social cues, crying due to frustration, and a strong liking of counting things. These are the things I am going to search my memory to see if and when they changed over time, and what new eccentricities, quirks, obsessions, and compulsions developed. The first major head trauma came when I was either about to turn six years old or already six. When we first moved to Alabama in April of 78, we lived in an old farmhouse six miles outside of the nearest town. We moved out of that house in 1979, The incident I remember occurred in that house, and the weather was not cold because my sister and I were wearing shorts. We had a tension chin-up bar that screwed outwards to fit inside of a door frame. We set it up in our bedroom door, laid bed pillows under it to cushion any falls we might have. At six and nine years old, we knew enough about injuries to know that doing gymnastics directly on a hardwood floor was a bad idea. My mother had come into the room and was talking to my sister while I was hanging upside down. My sister was gently swinging me back and forth by pushing my back. I felt my legs start to slip off the bar and I said, stop, I'm slipping. My sister didn't hear me, so she continued to push me while talking to my mother. I said it again a little louder, stop, I'm slipping. My sister either did not hear me or did not care. My leg slipped and I fell off the bar, head first into the pillow on the floor, before my mother could get the words out of her mouth to tell my sister to stop. That pillow did nothing to cushion the blood. The full force of my body fell about three feet and centered on the crown of my head. As I mentioned before, The farmhouse was six miles away from the nearest town, but it was also 12 miles away from the county hospital. CT scans were an emerging technology, crazy expensive, and the closest one was roughly two hours away from the house. So my mother checked me over. I could move all of my extremities. I had a massive headache and was very angry with my sister. So my mother did what we did in those days. She gave me an ice pack to put on it and called my doctor. Well, he advised her to keep an eye on me. He told her that if I started behaving strangely, had issues with my balance, or seemed overly tired, that she should take me to the county hospital ER. That was the best medical advice we had at the time. So I spent the rest of the day laying on the couch watching TV and nursing a headache with an ice pack on my head. About three weeks later, Two older kids on the school bus started biting, and I was hit in the head with a book bag. I also remember going into that barn before we moved to check on the kittens that lived there. When I pushed open the door, a piece of rotten wood fell down, hit me smack in the head. Both of these instances were ice pack and much, and that was my first grade year. I was in second grade when my mother started noticing changes in my behavior. First, I started wetting my pants in school at seven years old. Seven-year-olds should not be doing that. So, of course, the first thing my mother asked is, why? Well, once I could articulate it, she was able to draw out from me that I was afraid of getting into trouble. One of the other students had asked to go to the restroom. The teacher let her go, but when she came back, she was scolded for disrupting the class. So I got it in my head that I had to hold it no matter what until the scheduled restroom breaks. I developed an extreme fear of getting into trouble at school. I also had never been a violent child, but I started screaming and crying and throwing out white tantrums 
Whenever I didn't understand a joke or became frustrated with a project that I was working on, I resisted trying new activities because I was afraid I would not do well. I became even more obsessed with math and counting. Yes, one time I spilled rice on the kitchen floor and felt compelled to count each and every grain of rice as I cleaned it up. There were no head traumas that year, or at least none significant enough for my mom nor I to remember. The next head trauma came when I was eight years old in third grade. I was on a seesaw, sometimes called a cheater counter, with a classmate in the school playground. I was on the high side when someone pushed my classmate off of the low side. This sent me crashing to the ground. I bounced off and slammed my head on the ground. Now, we didn't have padded playgrounds back in the day. There were no rubber shavings to cushion our falls. No, our school playground had a six inch floor of concrete that was filled with pea gravel. Nope, I was playing in a six inch hole filled with small rocks. The following school year, when I was nine, I was shoved off the crow's nest of one of those climbing bar sets. I hit my head on one of the bars on the way down and then slammed it in the pea gravel. In both of these incidents, I was sent to the office, my mother was called, and I went home with an ice pack on my head. There was no school nurse. There was one nurse that visited five schools each week to conduct mandated health classes and assessment. She was not there on the days when I hit my head. In fifth grade, I was playing softball. I went to catch a fly ball, looked up, lost the ball in the sun, and found it with my left eye. Once again, immediate treatment involved an ice pack, and I did get a visit to the optometrist a week later. To this day, the vision in my left eye is worse than the vision in my right eye. And over the last year, I have noticed that two small black dots sometimes appear in the lower left field of vision of my left eye. During my last eye exam, the optometrist told me that there are no structural issues with either of my eyes, nor the part of the optic nerve that he can observe. However, he did say that old brain injuries can cause problems with vision decades later if the visual cortex is involved. The next notable trauma came when I was in 8th grade. I was helping to load the band equipment after a show, and someone had precariously stacked some percussion instruments. Well, a xylophone slid off the top of the stack and hit me square in the head. I actually blacked out after that one and was seeing stars when I came to. We were on a road trip, so the chaperone gave me an ice pack and told my parents when we got home. Since I seemed to be fine when I got home at 1.30 p.m. My father decided that he didn't want to waste his time in an emergency room and just sent me to bed. My ninth grade year, when I was 14, is when I changed. I had mostly accepted that I was different by that point in time. I knew I would never fit in with my classmates and pretty much gave up trying. I became defiant, as teenagers often do, but at the same time I developed new issues. My obsession with numbers and counting changed. To this day, I don't like odd numbers. If I'm in a place where I have to take a number and sit down, if I pull an odd number, I will trade my number with the next person in line just so I can have an even number. If I'm baking and I realize that I only have enough dough or batter to make an odd number of products, I will make some of them slightly smaller so that I end up with an even number. I like things to be balanced and even. Odd numbers make me nervous. In my 20s, I celebrated my birthday one day late 
because my birthday falls on an odd day of the month. The month is even, the year is even, but the day is odd. So I celebrated my birthday a day late so it would all be even numbers. Yeah, that is an obsession that began when I was 14 years old. There is no rational explanation for this. I had always been a very polite, very well-mannered child. But for a reason unknown to me, I started being rude. I didn't intend to be rude. I didn't want to be rude. It's more like a combination of not understanding the social cues to begin with, coupled with the filter between my brain and my mouth just not working. I didn't take the time to choose the best words and stated whatever was on my mind in a very blunt manner. For example, a classmate wore a dress one day and asked me if I liked Rather than saying that it was a nice dress, but the color didn't suit her, I just straight up said, you look like a break. It was a loose-fitting purple dress. It was well-made and styled to the fashion of the time. It was a perfectly good dress. But it was a deep purple. It didn't work with her complexion. It actually put a purple hue on her face. So when I looked at her, I saw a grape. And I stated very bluntly, you look like a grape. Well, that hurt her feelings, and some of her friends chastised me for being rude. I didn't see it as being rude. I was being honest. And I was becoming more disconnected from society. This is when I started feeling lost. I was intelligent. I got good grades. I absorbed information easily, acing most tests without ever studying. Every aptitude test I took said I would be great at whatever I set my mind to. The issue was that I had no passion to be great at anything. I couldn't maintain focus on any one thing long enough to become great. I might be 100% focused and dedicated to being a rocket scientist and studying physics in the morning, but by the afternoon I want to be the best jazz clarinetist ever. Clarinetist. Yeah, I think that's the right word. I'm not sure. My train of thought was easily derailed and, well, quite frankly, still is. I had no sense of direction. I also started hoarding. I was afraid to throw away anything because I might need it at some later point in time. Seriously. Now, I have made progress in this area. I can actually clean my house now and throw away things that I haven't used for the last five years. At one point in time, I had a 20-year-old shirt in my closet because it might just come back into fashion one of these days. I did finally throw it away. Honestly, I got rid of it about, oh, six, seven years ago. Now, I'm not going to go into details on the rest of these. During ninth and 10th grades, I remember taking significant blows to my head five times. This still doesn't count. The numerous times I lost my sense of space and banged my head on something while walking or standing up. I still stand up in my freezer handle at least two or three times a year. So it was the end of my 10th grade year when I started self-harming. Cutting myself became a way of releasing frustration, anger, and the pain that lived inside of me. My 11th and 12th grade years came with three more head traumas that would be considered significant today. Then my facial kick started. See, when I, when I smile, my smile is crooked. Can you see that? Well, when I am anxious, the left corner of my mouth will start to twitch and tick uncontrollably. Guess what? 
I now had a crooked smile. My smile was not always crooked. So that pretty much wraps up my childhood head dramas. But I do need to point out, correlation does not equal causation. Looking back, I can remember significant head traumas and note changes that occurred after those traumas. There is a correlation between instances of head trauma and development of new or worsening behaviors, obsessions, compulsions, and eccentricities. That does not necessarily mean that the head traumas caused these. I know that I had concussions based on loss of consciousness, disrupted vision, and massive headaches that followed. However, I have no idea idea how severe any individual one was. I don't know if they would be classified as TBIs because CT and MRI machines, well, they were too far away and too expensive to use. I was born neurodivergent and it appears that cannot be stated with any certainty that the head trauma sustained during childhood added to my psychological difficulties. So what does that mean for my future? I have no idea. As I get older, I find that I have less patience with other people. If I work with you, I expect you to know how to do your job. I get irritated when people ask me questions that they should already know the answers to. I have to excuse myself from situations because the impulse to smack someone whom I perceive as insulting or defaming me is growing. When I get angry, I literally see red. And I have to catch myself before I lash out. I also get angry more easily. And Doc, well, he was a high school athlete and sustained far more TBIs than I did. He is terrified that the cumulative effect of those head injuries means that he has or will develop CTT and one day he's just going to snap. My concern is that I will slowly lose myself as the nerve cells in my brain degenerate. My mind has always been my greatest asset. What happens if my mind goes away? Or worse yet, what happens if my motor skills degenerate and I end up stuck with a strong mind in a body that no longer works? If I think about it too long, I become genuinely frightened and paralyzed. I took steps in the form of a living will while I'm still of sound mind and body to make my wishes very clear should a time come when I cannot make decisions or communicate for myself. In the long run, that's all any of us can do. I try not to worry about it too much while ensuring that measures are in place if they are ever needed. I continue to be as cognizant of my moods and motivations as I can be and self-regulate while I still can. I think I've said about all I can about my experiences with head traumas and how they've influenced my mental landscape. What do you think? Are you concerned at all about those bumps and bruises you received in childhood coming back to haunt you later in life? Did your experiences influence how you treated and protected your children? How did you decide which bumps were minor and which needed medical evaluation? Knowing what we know now, do you think today's children are protected more against CTE? Or are these safety measures making them afraid to get out there and live? How do we balance the adventurous nature of children with keeping them safe from long-term harm? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed my little trip down memory lane and my observations from later in life, Please let me know. 
like this video by giving it a big old thumbs up. Subscribe by ringing that bell. Comment to let me know your thoughts on the map. Share this video with your friends and family. This channel is not possible without your support, so thank you for stopping by. I will see you next time.